Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 6 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. In today's lecture, we will be discussing about different analogies which can help the user in terms of identification of seismic sources. In earlier discussions, we have seen that whenever earthquake happens primarily along the fault plane which is representation of some plane of unconformity where possible movement in terms of hanging wall and foot wall must have happened during a particular earthquake and whenever this movement happens as a part of this particular movement there will be some building up of strain energy which gets released and cause earthquakes. So, when this energy release happens there will be development of seismic waves these waves propagate to larger distances causing damages and even these waves are interacting with near surface material also leading to amplification change in frequency content. So, overall whenever we are interested to find out uh, what are the potential ground motion in a particular region of interest one has to be careful in identification of what are the active sources which are available in a particular region. In later lectures we will also see how the faults which are potential sources of earthquake occurrence can be used in order to determine the seismic hazard values or in order to quantify the potential ground motion at a particular site of interest. So, overall in order to find out the potential ground motion one is how bigger was the earthquake. In later slide we will also see that depending upon the magnitude of the earthquake we can classify the earthquake may be minor earthquake, major earthquake, great earthquakes. Similarly, depending upon the position of the epicenter of the earthquake with respect to plate boundaries we have we can have may be plate boundary earthquake, we can have intra plate earthquakes also. Again depending upon the epicentral distance range also there are classifications which are given which will be discussed in later classes. In today's lecture primarily we will be focusing on how to identify a particular fault and primarily in terms of whether it should be called as an active fault. Active fault means where one can say confidently like this is the fault or this is a seismic source which has potential to again undergo any earthquake primarily during the design life. Again uh, when we discuss about seismic sources one has to also take into account the importance of the structure which on, on which basically the earthquake loading has to be determined. If we are talking about routine buildings we can go ahead with uh, maybe the zonation maps based on which one can identify how much is seismic loading prone to or should be taken into account while designing a part particular earthquake resistant building. However, whenever it comes to uh, very important structures such as bridges, dams, nuclear power plants one has to be more careful in terms of understanding the seismicity. Again in terms of seismicity it is not only about the seismicity which is known in terms of ground motion which is known in terms of uh, earth records, but also one can refer to iso seismal maps. In addition one can also refer to what are the potential seismic sources which are available in a particular region and the seismic activity corresponding to each of these seismic sources. Because there might be a possibility that there are seismic sources, but such sources have not been identified so far because again during different different set of studies there might be specific reasons and again depending upon the target of those studies there might be level of details which might be explored in different regions in order to identify what are active faults, what are seismic sources what are hidden faults. Later on when we will discuss about source characterization we will also see that not every place you will have well identified information about faults. In such a case what are the measures one has to take into account, what are the uh, guidelines methodology which are available which can help even in, in, in times when earthquake information in terms of fault is not available. So, how one can take uh, past earthquake information without taking fault information into account. So, that will be also discussed in later lectures. In today's lecture as I mentioned it is mainly focusing on analogy which will help in identifying whether in a particular region there are faults. Secondly, if there are faults again uh, if there are faults to take into account some direct or indirect features or representations on ground 
may be subsurface features also suggesting that potentially a source which is available in a particular region which can be also identified using uh, 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 may be remote sensing data based on GPS measurement based on other, uh, other types of uh, in situ measurements and which, which will definitely take uh, give an indication that there might be a possibility an active fault might be there. So, how to decide whether a particular source is available in a particular region and how to decide this particular source to be called as active source or inactive source. As far as source is inactive that means, the source does not have significant potential to cause earthquake at least during the design life of the structure. If a fault is considered as active that means, this particular fault again depending upon the dimension of the fault has capability to cause earthquake as, as, as just mentioned that depending upon the dimension of the structure depending upon the dimension of the fault a small fault may produce some magnitude earthquake, larger earthquake can be produced by significantly larger fault and then again if you are talking about great earthquake that means, any earthquake having magnitude greater than 8 you have to have significantly larger dimensions of the fault plane which are actually available for the release of seismic energy. So, if you are talking about active faults, inactive faults in today's lecture we will be discussing about what are the faults in a nutshell, what are the faults, how you define a particular fault. Now, when we are discussing about the fault, it is basically three dimensional uh, uh, model or three dimensional uh, property of a particular plane. So, how it can be represented may be in three dimension, may be on two dimensional plane. So, that one can take this generalized information and use it for uh, depending upon the purpose, it can be used by a different set of people. So, what are the important terminology, how you define a particular seismic fault. As mentioned over here, seismic means a particular seismic source which is capable of producing earthquake. Then while doing this, we will also come across in, in what uh, criteria one should disclose that a particular fault should be called as active. That means, depending upon its activity or whether it is in current state or during a particular user defined period again that keeps on varying with respect to uh, uh, region of interest to declare whether a particular fault has capability to again show activity during the design life or it is not going to show. Then mostly whenever we are discussing about active faults, identification of active faults, the neotectonics of the region will come into picture to give you a possible hint to give you an indirect indication of that the region which you are talking about is potentially an active region or potentially there might be a seismic uh, uh, fault which definitely requires more detailed investigation to verify. So, later on we can we can uh, bring geological evidences, we can bring maybe remote sensing observations, aerial photographs and, and many more information to narrow down again that a potential fault has been identified in a particular region. So, so we will be starting with uh, the objective was to find out the loading because of earthquake. Whenever we are going with hazard assessment, definitely we will take into account all possible seismic sources which are available in and around of your particular region. Because whenever any particular seismic source is going to produce an earthquake, definitely there will be some ground motion which will be transferred to your site of interest. So, it may not be related that every time uh, seismic source and the site of interest should be in very close proximity. Even an 8 magnitude earthquake can cause significant devastation, significant ground shaking even at 500 kilometer, 550 kilometer radial distance from your epicenter or from your focus. So, that means, whenever we are interested to find out the earthquake loading condition, we have to find out more confidently what are the active sources which are available maybe in 500, 600 kilometer radial distance, which if taken into account that will give you more confidence about the seismic activity which is happening within your seismotectonic province. So, uh, uh, overall the objective here is again to go ahead with identification of active faults to gain more confidence in terms of what are the seismic sources available in addition to the seismic sources. Later on we will also take into account what are the potential database which can be referred in order to find out uh, past earthquake in a particular region they, that might be related to. Uh, uh, recorded ground motion or it may be related to historic earthquakes. 
So, again we will be discussing about some of the characteristics based on which one can uh, again narrow down to whether it is an active fault. Then in situ measurements are there in terms of seismic tomography which will help again in identifying maybe heterogeneity which are present in a medium or some thin linear features which are available along the ground surface which can potentially narrow down like there are some uh, anomalies which supports the presence of active faults are present in a particular region. Then development in case of seismic imaging what are the recent advancement in terms of identification of inelastic uh, uh, properties in a particular region whether in terms of um, uh, using dense seismic arrays to find out a larger uh, uh, to find out uh, maybe properties on a larger platform or in terms of frequency domain. So, all these we will be also touching upon here. Then we will also discuss about what are the active fault mapping, what are the information which can be used and where it can be uh, utilized. Then map representation, how, how we are going to represent these information whether you are talking about faults, whether you are talking about uh, uh, maybe age of the fault, maybe you are talking about relative slips which are available or potential slips which are uh, uh, which are prone to happen during different different faults. So, how these things are going to happen again globally. So, we will be having data set from different different sources how those can be combined in order to find out again development of maps and what are the globally identified active faults based on the such studies. Then we will be referring to the earlier discussion which we will be having over here primarily related to characterization of active faults. We will be also trying to solve one numerical which will directly give an indication that whenever we are talking about a particular seismic source how roughly an idea about the size of earthquake it can produce can be obtained or otherwise if we are having some measurement related to in situ slip on a particular fault, how that can be utilized over here or in situ rupture which has happened along the fault, but at different different segments. So, collectively how that information can be utilized here to find out what might have been the magnitude of that particular earthquake, because ruptures surface manifestations offsets these are basically clearly visible features on the ground surface during different earthquakes. So, again what are inactive faults and at times which has been seen also on again on geological scale there, there might be some faults which were active may be in geological time scale and has become inactive or vice versa. So, some faults were there which were inactive, but because of some processes uh, which became dominant in uh, geological time scale now these have become active faults. So, overall uh, we will be touching upon the topics because the, again the, the objective of this particular course is to give you an idea about how the sources are producing earthquake, how this earthquake which are produced on a particular fault or if the fault information is not there, how this information of uh, past earthquake can be utilized to quantify ground motion and later on this ground motion can be modified along the propagation path because of local side effect, how it can be utilized to quantify the liquefaction potential of a particular site and in the end of this particular course, how collectively the information which we will be learning throughout the course can be utilized to develop microzonation maps for a particular study area. So, going with the active fault before that we will be discussing about seismic sources or faults. So, primarily when we discuss about seismic sources basically we are interested to find out what are the features which are available either on the surface or beneath the surface because many a time these features which are showing potential movement on the ground surface are also visible, but most of the time these features or these movements will be happening significant depth along the fault plane. So, in order to understand what is happening along the fault plane along uh, according to United States Geological Survey a seismic fault is a fracture. So, you can say here this is completely a fracture along which potential movement or zone of fracture along which the two blocks one block which is called as hanging block which we discussed in earlier class also. So, hanging wall which is generally located above your fault plane or plane of rupture and secondly the foot wall which is located below your plane of rupture or the plane along which the potential movement during a particular earthquake has happened are available. Again, 
So, this hanging wall, this is foot wall. Generally, foot wall will be below the fault plane and hanging wall will be above the fault plane. Again, whenever the movement is happening, the movement must be happening along the dip direction. So, this direction in which the fault plane is oriented, the direction with respect to horizontal, so whatever angle it is making, that is called as dip angle. How much dip it is there? If it is 90 degree dip, that means the fault plane is almost vertical and anything between greater than 0 degree and 90 degree is also possible. If it is goes more than 90 degree, then we have rule of V s which is also discussed in the lecture. Again direction of dip, we have discussed it is the inclination of fault plane with respect to horizontal. If we see a particular fault plane on the ground surface, we will be able to only see a linear feature. So, how the orientation of this linear feature? existing on the ground surface. If you see this particular inclination with respect to north, so how much the line which is representing the fault plane or the line which is the interaction of fault plane with respect to ground surface, what is the inclination of this particular line with respect to north that is called as the strike of the particular fault. So, strike is going to give you what is the orientation of fault line or fault trace which is available on the ground surface. If we are talking about fault plane, so in addition to strike, we will be having another value that is called as dip of a particular fault. Dip is going to give you that what is the inclination in which the fault trace or fault line has to be extended beneath the ground surface. Remember, on the feature, which, which is uh, I mean on the map, we will be having a clear indication about what is the length of the fault because accordingly that much particular length of fault trace is available on the ground surface. You can extend that particular length in the direction of the dip, it is approximately going to give you the fault plane. If we can ha also have an idea about the rupture width, then subsequently this particular dimension in which the fault plane is extending along the dip direction. So, that is going to give you a two dimensional space along the fault plane, which is potentially the region in which either the uh, significant portion or a small portion of that particular region will undergo rupture during a particular earthquake. So, we are talking about a plane along which two blocks are there, one is hanging wall, other one is foot wall. Now, because of convection current which we have discussed in earlier lecture also, what will happen the two blocks will be having some movement, this movement can be towards each other classifying reverse faulting, it can be away from each other, normal faulting or there can be slide pass movement, which is called as strike slip fault. So, we can see over here, the type of movement, the nature of movement, if the two blocks are moving away from each other or towards each other, in both the cases there will be with respect to foot wall, there will be movement of hanging wall, whether it is moving away, whether it is moving towards. So, such movement which is basically uh, um, explaining the direction in which the hanging wall is moving with respect to foot wall that is called as slip direction or it is also called as rack angle. So, this is called as rack angle or slip angle, angle of slip. So, completely if you are having rack angle, you are having slip uh, uh, dip angle, you are having strike angle and the fault trace using these four parameters, you will be able to actually locate a fault plane. Later on, we will also discuss about fault plane solution. So, actually if you are going to represent this particular kind of movement, whether it is normal faulting, reverse faulting, strike slip faulting, that can be also represented in beach wall solutions, which we will be discussing in other lectures. So, hanging wall. So, this is the typical movement. Now, during a particular earthquake, what will happen? The two blocks will be moving away from each other towards each other, which can be shown over here in terms of this particular animation. So, now if we take into account this particular animation, there might be a particular plane which is common to both hanging wall and foot wall along which because of this particular movement of hanging and foot wall, there is development of shear stresses, which is actually going to cause storage of strain energy, which will later on be released in terms of earthquake. So, this is about angle of dip, foot wall, hanging wall. This is more or less in a nutshell the definition of a particular fault, which will be required in order to locate a particular fault at least on a 
global scale. So, using this particular fault trace coordinates, one can find out exactly where the fault trace is located. Then take dip direction, you can locate the fault uh, plane. Taking strike into account, you can locate what is the orientation of the fault trace and dip angle is uh, the slip angle is going to give you what is the direction in which the movement along a particular fault is happening. Now, if we talk about active faults, why it is required because not all the faults firstly if, if we take into account the linear features, not all linear features which are available may be on satellite data, may be on aerial photographs, not all the features are capable of producing um, earthquakes like if, if you are talking about uh, uh, linear features many a time there will be uh, uh, continuous land where vegetation is growing that on aerial photograph may give you some indication some linear feature is there, but certainly that feature is not related to fault or it is not capable of producing earthquakes. Similarly, shear zones can be there which are again potential regions where shearing is happening, but whether it is causing earthquake or not again it has to be uh, discussed folds are there. So, it is not it is it is called a very gentle process where the accumulation of strain will be happening, but certainly it will not lead to uh, uh, occurrence of earthquakes. So, active faults as I mentioned in the beginning also what are the faults what are the seismic sources which have produced earthquakes in some geological time scale, but in order to define whether these are again capable of producing some seismic event. Uh, that is called as identification of active faults. So, active faults can be defined as seismic sources that have moved, moved means any kind of potential movement between hanging wall and foot wall, any kind of movement which has happened along a particular source or a seismic fault in the recent past. How much is the recent past? That again depends upon the feature of the region depending upon how much information is also available in terms of maybe geological evidences and, and so on. And in terms of uh, recent past and may move, may move means these are the potential sources which can again cause earthquakes. Now, when it caused earthquake in the past that again depends from the region tectonic settings and geological evidences which are available to us, but we cannot ignore that these are the potential sources which can also cause earthquake in near future. That means, if we are going to collect uh, if, if we are going to uh, drop the probability that these can also produce earthquakes definitely and if such sources are very close to your site of interest. If we are not taking this activity into account what will happen? We will end up in underestimating the seismic hazard of a particular source or seismic hazard of a particular region, because as source is very close to your site of interest definitely that particular source can cause more ground motion even uh, during small earthquake. Rather a particular source which may be located at 400, 500 kilometer distance away from your site of interest. So, we, we cannot basically avoid the probability that uh, even there is a source what is the activity it whether it this particular source has shown any significant movement in the past or what are the chances it can show any significant movement again in the near future as far as the design life of the structure is concerned. And again uh, not every time the design life of the structure, but also uh, one has to also take into account the importance of the structure. Suppose nuclear power plant is there certainly we will not only take into account the uh, the design life of the structure we have to also take into account that what if this particular infrastructure undergoes failure because it will not be simply the uh, uh, structural failure of a particular uh, infrastructure there will be radiation leak there will be lot of uh, devastation uh, like major scale devastation which may which is going to trigger in case a nuclear facility undergoes failure primarily the reaction chamber if undergoes failure what kind of uh, 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 damage scenario it is going to trigger. So, taking that probability into account which is uh, one of its kind of havoc which nobody wants to have at a particular nuclear power plant particularly in order to uh, arrange the fission reaction before significant ground motion which can actually cause any kind of leakage from the reaction chamber. So, again in such a case what we will do we will try to 
find out any particular seismic source which is available in your 600, 700 kilometer radial distance away around your site of interest depending upon whatever guidelines says. So, that each and every seismic source around your site of interest should be able to identify it. So, that can be uh, that can be identified as it can be further uh, defined as a seismic source that has caused surface rupture. Many a times these will also cause some kind of rupture near the surface or even surface manifestation some indirect measurements uh, some direct uh, hint of some movement has happened uh, beneath the ground surface may be in terms of offset a significant portion of ground before and after an earthquake you can see it has been raised primarily a surface manifestation. So, that can again uh, 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 can be used in order to find out the magnitude of the earthquake. So, as per Tifonov and Meshit 1993 potentially an active fault have been identified as faults which have shown any activity in less than 10 k a, k a is kilo annum that means 1000 years. So, anything which has shown activity in terms of possible movement any kind of surface manifestation in less than 10000 years which is belonging to Holocene age in geological time scale that can be called as active and at the same time any kind of activity if not in 10000 years anything between 10000 years to 1 lakh 30000 years which is called as Pleistocene period. So, whether the fault has shown or the seismic source has shown any kind of surface manifestation in last 10000 years or Holocene period or between 10000 and 1 lakh 30000 years any kind of manifestation which uh, the seismic source has created on the surface in terms of surface manifestation that can be again called as active fault. So, the study of active fault as I mentioned it provides quite important information primarily about not only about the sources which have produced in the past uh, which have produced earthquakes in the past, but also at the same time these are the sources if found active certainly can uh, produce earthquake in the near future. Again uh, as I mentioned if we are able to locate those sources which are again may be surface manifestation or may be uh, based on in situ measurement at least continue the points which are showing similar activity based on geological evidences or may be based on tomographic observations. So, it is going to give you a linear feature on the ground surface taking that linear feature into account one can get an idea about what are the potential size which this particular earthquake can potentially produce in the near future. Uh, right now we are not talking about the seismic activity rather we are only talking about taking the dimension of that particular fault rupture length rupture width taking that dimension into account what is the likely to be size of the magnitude which this particular seismic source can produce in the near future. So, the study of active fault primarily is about location of the potential sources which can produce earthquake which again will narrow down to what are the potential location in which future earthquakes can happen and if these earthquakes are going to happen what is will be the size of these earthquakes. Again the concept as I mentioned it is very important in nuclear power plants because uh, whenever ground motion happens during a particular earthquake and if it is going to be transferred to nuclear containment facilities if the ground shaking is significant enough to cause any kind of radiation leak there it will not be only limited to the nuclear power plant, but to a larger area which is there may be in around 500 600 kilometer radial distance or may be more than that which may be exposed to uh, 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 may be significant radiation or may be the lesser area also, but the devastation which will be caused in the nearby region will be significant. So, an earthquake which might be happening at some fault because which is located at 500 kilometer from your radial distance of nuclear containment facility if it is causing any kind of leakage in the radiation surrounding that particular nuclear power plant there will be lot of devastation. So, primarily nuclear power facilities identification of active faults it is it is a continuous uh, process. So, uh, uh, unlike routine structure whenever we are going for uh, hazard analysis of a particular nuclear power plant certainly one has to take into account 
what are the active faults which are available in a particular region based on existing studies and if possible a separate detailed studies related to identification of active fault in a particular region can also be parallelly taken into account. Again mentioned over here is k a is kilo annum or 1 k a means 1000 years, 1000 years. Identification of active faults will also help in identifying the locations because whenever there is active fault, if it is uh, uh, if it is causing any kind of ground subsidence or if it is causing any kind of surface manifestation uh, offset potentially if it is going to get repeated in near future again these features will also get repeated. Similarly, with respect to ground fissures in terms of landslide which is again the loading because of occurrence of earthquake on a particular fault which has been triggered on a particular slope triggering to landslide. So, if you are finding close to a slide or, or close to a particular slope, we find an active fault that definitely increases the probability that this particular slope which is very close to an active fault can undergo failure in near future. So, this such kind of analogy can also be developed if we are able to find out location of active faults and in addition to location the size of the earthquake because you will be getting a dimension may be uh, length of the fault trace or may be two dimensional. Uh, information or may be the surface manifestation which also can give you an indication about the potential size of the earthquake. Similarly, with respect to liquefaction, so liquefaction is whenever ground shaking or the seismic waves generated during a particular earthquakes are passing through a particular medium, these cause disturbance in the particle, particle undergo motion. In particularly case of liquefaction, there will be development of excess pore pressure because of wave propagation. As a result of this excess pore pressure, it will push all the particles away from each other. So, there will not be particle in close contact with respect to each other to offer resistance to shear loading. All the particles will be away from each other such that if we see the consistency of the soil in liquefied state, it will be almost like a liquid, it is almost kind of flowing consistency. So, if we are going to find out some cohesionless deposit or soil which are prone to undergo liquefaction based on the characteristics of the medium very close to your active fault, certainly one has to be extra careful that these are the locations which have undergone uh, 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 liquefaction, which have shown liquefaction in the past or are potentially liquefiable, but because these are also located very close to an active fault, these are also going to I mean, these are active uh, one has to be very careful while dealing with those sources because these can cause liquefaction. Similarly, with respect to ground subsidence also. So, lot of ground subsidence again the ground is very soft there are more chances that because of overcoming load or even in addition to structure uh, superstructure load the ground can show any kind of subsidence settlement like that. So, one has to be more careful about these features to get repeated in case there is active fault identified in the nearby region because this can cause again lot of devastation, lot of damages and even at times complete collapse of the building and corresponding casualties. So, characterization of active fault as I mentioned, we are interested to find out active faults and that currently the may be the, the rate of movement it is not significant. If you take into account the average slip which is happening may be once in a I mean around the year or maybe once in 10 years that is not significant to decide whether the fault is active or not, because the rate at which the slip is supposed to happen it is at present it is not that much significant since one has started taking in situ measurement. So, characterization of active faults mostly depend upon the neotectonic period, what are the compressional stresses, what are the extensional stresses or tensile stresses when these stresses came into existence first time on this particular fault which triggered some kind of movement all along this particular fault and because of this particular movement which continued for a certain period that had actually triggered liquefaction uh, earthquake occurrence. So, again it depends upon the tecton neotectonic of a particular region and the active tectonism of a particular terrain how active 
terrain here we are not talking about a particular fault but terrain so that means even if a particular fault is not showing significant movement but there are seismic sources in and around of your, uh, in and around of your particular target active faults which are significantly active definitely some component of those movement will trigger seismic activity on this particular fault as well so active tectonics of the terrain is also important as far as the seismic activity of a particular active fault is concerned. Now, neotectonics as I mentioned we have to take into account the neotectonic features. So, the this field of study that is neotectonic it is primarily related to uh, the horizontal as well as vertical crustal movement which is happening beneath the ground surface primarily in geologically recent past and which may also be ongoing even today. So, some kind of horizontal or vertical movement manifestation offsets which have happened in geological time scale either it has happened in the past or in the past has happened, but even also it is continuing the present collectively all these information is are going to give you information about neotectonics that means, some signature of activity in terms of crystal movement whether it is horizontal, whether it is vertical or whether it is a combination of horizontal and vertical both. However, there is a dispute uh, uh, about like how much time one should take into account with respect to present in order to decide that any kind of horizontal or vertical crystal movement should be taken into account to decide that this should be considered as the duration of neotectonic setting. This should be considered as the duration for which based on new set tectonic setting one can define that a particular fault is active or not. So, in order to resolve this uh, uh, controversy neotectonism starts at different times for different region that is the general analogy the onset of neotectonic period or the current tectonic regime depends upon when contemporary stresses if we if we remember the animation which was shown in earlier slide the two blocks are coming in contact with each other in terms of compression. So, when these compression or stresses or contemporary stress, stresses firstly came into existence to cause any kind of potential movement along this particular fault that will define what should be the region of neotectonism for a particular region of interest. For example, is given over here particularly for Apines in central Italy the duration for neotectonism can be as uh, long as middle quaternary which is ranging close to uh, 7 lakh years with respect to the present. Similarly, if we are talking about sub Himalayan faults and thrust belt the neotectonism can range between 2 to 3 million years from present in order to take in situ features to detect any kind of potential horizontal or vertical crystal movement or to locate potential surface manifestation belonging to these details or these periods to decide that this particular fault which is available as a linear feature in my study area is basically classified as uh, active fault. So, analysis of neotectonic movement primarily related to how much is the movement which is happening in uh, which had happened in maybe horizontal vertical direction gives you an idea about the time span for which the tectonic structure had been active whether it is acting at present or whether it was active in the past. So, all these features will cover when we go for neotectonic setting based identification and definitely it will also quantify the deformation which has accumulated in order to get some information about what is the likely to be occurring magnitude for the future earthquake. So, potential parameters which, uh, which can be taken into account to identify particular activation as well as reactivation or in a nutshell about um, active fault in a particular region. So, one can refer to significant significantly differential vertical motions. Secondly, one can take into account there is development of dynamic topography near the plate boundaries. So, there is uh, one can see about significant change in uh, may be sea level may be uh, basin or fault inversion also another feature which can be clubbed with respect to uh, dynamic topography which can again give you some hint or some parametric understanding about potential neotectonism of a particular region. And based on the neotectonic regime 
one can identify whether a particular fault will be called as active fault or inactive fault. Similarly, with respect to lithospheric foldings, one can club with respect to identification of parameters for neotectonic setting as well as with respect to identification of active faults. So, sea level fluctuation if we take into account, sea level fluctuation can be triggered by means of continental uh, collision or because of subduction at the plate boundaries. Many a times these can be also an indication of the building up of stresses along the two sides of the plate boundaries, which can also cause in addition to collision some kind of fluctuation in the sea level or mean sea level significant variation. So, if we are able to find out the features along the plate boundaries, which are giving an indication about fluctuation in the sea level in geological time scale, it is going to give you an indication about and uh, about uh, uh, neotectonic activities and subsequently even in the ridge region for intraplate earthquakes, uh, intraplate system also one can seek for these kinds of features. Similarly, with respect to basin of fault inversion that means, before uh, in uh, uh, if you talk about uh, neotectonism. So, considering the duration of neotectonism, the nature of the fault whether it was belonging to normal faulting, now it is it has changed it has gone to maybe uh, uh, normal faulting, if it was normal faulting it has gone to reverse faulting. So, it is like before and after the neotectonic period what is the change which has happened which which is indication that completely change in or reversal in the in the in the terms of uh, the dominating stresses on a particular fault mechanism. So, that can also taken into account as additional features in order to uh, arrive at the parameters defining the activity of a particular fault. So, sedimentary basin formed under extensional conditions are uplifted due to intraplate crustal shortening these are called as basin inversion reactivation of the fault in opposite direction to original that means, initially it was normal faulting later on it became reverse faulting or it was reverse faulting became maybe strike slip faulting or like completely change in the nature of the movement along a particular fault plane. Lithospheric fold, folding, so interplate folding, so it is like gradual process which had led to some kind of folding in the lithospheric regions particularly related to strong oceanic lithosphere. So, these are an indication that stresses are concentrated primarily in a particular geometric and dynamic condition. So, this is basically there are some concentration of stresses which are happening along the oceanic lithosphere which are indication of that in addition to above two parameters that there are some region where are some concentration of stresses are going on which can lead to uh, narrow down the study area for further detailed studies. Now, characterization of active faults as I mentioned in the beginning that based on uh, uh, type of movement which is shown maybe in Holocene period or maybe in Pleistocene period in a general nutshell it can be called as active fault, but again what is the region uh, uh, one has to be taken into uh, one should take into account to give a generalized understanding about active faults. So, United States Atomic Energy Commission in the year 1973 proposed a set of criteria to recognize potential faults to cause surface manifestation. Now, we have moved from active faults to the faults which can at least give you surface manifestation. Again those surface manifestation one can refer with respect to the neotectonic features or neotectonic setting which will again help in identifying the active faults. So, one movement at least based on the surface manifestation any kind of uh, feature which is giving an indication that at least one movement which has happened at or near the ground surface in last 35,000 years. So, any kind of significant features available indicating that movement at the near ground surface in the last 35,000 years you certainly call it as active fault identified based on surface manifestation. If not in uh, 35,000 years then more than one kind of movement which has happened in the last 5 lakh years based again on surface manifestation uh, details. So, it is again going to give you 
potentially these are the faults which are which can be caused as active faults primarily related to U, uh, US atomic energy commission. Again we can uh, we can also take into account geomorphic features which are an indication of displacement at the surface. That means, many a times because of earthquake occurrence some land might be raised offset will be created. So, this is again evidence of displacement which are definitely visible on the ground surface which are geomorphic features indicating some kind of building up of stresses or release of stresses at certain depth when the ground surface has happened and at times fault scarp is also there. So, you can directly see a portion of the fault available on the ground surface. So, again this is an indication of that the particular fault is active or at least has been active in the geological past. Instrumentally, if you are having uh, uh, um, information about like you can narrow down the epicenter of the earthquakes, you can take earthquake uh, ground motion into account definitely it is also going to give you an indication about a particular fault which has been active even at present. And evidences, so you are many a times will be having the slip value, sometime rupture characteristics of nearby regions which will also indication that the particular entire region is been active in terms of seismic activity. So, taking those evidences also into account and correlating surface features may be fault scarp, displacement values, offset values again can give you an idea that a particular linear feature which is available on the ground surface satisfies the condition for active fault. Now, as far as in situ uh, measurements are consider, uh, concerned, we can go with seismic imaging which helps in understanding the subsurface feature available beneath the ground surface primarily in high resolution and this can be also used in order to find out the surface ruptures of seismic faults or seismogenic faults or sources. So, one can take into account the seismic data that means ground motion data or if you are going with maybe micro tremor information you can take those into account club them with respect to geophysical geological data which is again going to give you information about subsurface features. So, you are having some data in terms of how for a particular signature the ground has responded. Again what is the characteristics of the medium you can take maybe uh, strength characteristics into account maybe heterogeneity into account club those again geological database what are the depositions available in a particular region, what are the crystal medium characteristics in a particular region and what are the near surface geology in a particular region. So, clubbing in situ data which is coming based on uh, geophysical measurement which are coming from sensor records, ground motion records and the geological information. If these can be clubbed together, they will definitely give an indication about identification of active fault in a particular region. Again I am repeating the, the sole purpose of this particular lecture is to give an overview about what is active fault and why an active fault identification in a particular region is important as far as primarily the hazard part is concerned. So, hazard is going to give you potentially taking the faults in and around of your particular site of interest what is the expected level of ground shaking in a particular region or a particular site. So, one has to take definitely active faults into account in order to find out the locations which can show some signature significant features. Okay. So, uh, seismic tomography as we mentioned that will help in identifying may be uh, uh, the heterogeneity which are present in a particular region. So, it is quite useful tool as far as imaging the subsurface feature of a uh, earth. It requires involved um, uh, iterative procedure where you can actually uh, compare the signature which is coming from initial earth model and the actual ground motion signature and every time once you are going with iterative procedure you, you keep on modifying your initial earth model such that the time uh, uh, travel time between the your actual ground motion rec uh, actual record as well as the record which you are getting from your earth model can be minimized. That means, now your in the initial earth model which had undergone to iterative procedure now has been revised significantly and it is giving you very close indication about how much is the what is the characteristics of subsurface structure in a particular region or site of interest. So, that is significantly uh, well popular uh, methodology as far as subsurface feature understanding is concerned. 
So, as I mentioned it requires minimizing the travel time difference between the actual record as well as the record which you are generating based on a model subsurface uh, characteristics and it is generally compared in terms of distribution of primary wave or shear wave velocities how these are varying with respect to the distance which are again indication of medium physical properties strength characteristics of the medium which we will also discuss about these waves when we will uh, come to lecture related to seismic waves in a particular uh, medium. So, these variation will also help in understanding change in the physical properties of the medium in terms of lithology also in terms of presence of porosity in a particular medium and the fluid content which is available may be in unconformity may be in gaps which can also cause significant effect in terms of uh, triggering the uh, events. Okay. So, again uh, the uh, seismic tomography can one can find out application in terms of identifying variation in discontinuity particularly morovistic discontinuity how there is change or dipping in morovistic discontinuity because of seismic activity in different regions one can look into. Then how the in situ tectonic settings are leading to indenting indentation on the thickness uh, the crystal medium. Similarly, with respect to subduction of lithosphere one can also look into when we are taking uh, seismic tomography into account. Then there are there again methods which can be used again to find out the subsurface features and to narrow down to uh, understanding the tectonic setting of a particular region. So, sub, uh, surface wave tomography is there, then control source seismology is there, then tele seismic tomography is there, local earthquake tomography is there and ambient noise tomography is there. So, every time when we are talking about uh, tomography basically we are the attempt is to find out more accurately about subsurface features of the earth which will also help in identifying whether it is related to rock, porosity, fluid characteristics, how these things in terms of primary and shear wave velocities are changing beneath the ground surface. This is again the same thing which I mentioned. So, we will take in situ data compare the in situ data after a particular uh, processing because there will be noise also in that particular uh, uh, record. So, we have to filter out that noise and then compare this initial earth model update it such that the signature is matching with your actual ground motion record. So, in the end you will get seismic wave profiles which will help in identifying the variation in the medium characteristics in the subsurface medium. Dense wide aperture, uh, <coughs> dense wide aperture acquisition again in this particular thing we, we can use large dense network of uh, sensors. Again each sensor is operating in a large range of frequency content. So, that can give you very accurate information even about thin layers which are available or small faults which are available in a particular region. So, accuracy can be enhanced if you are increasing may be very closed seismic sensors with larger array aperture that means, you are now covering at each sensor you are covering a larger array or larger range of frequency content such that it can give you more accurate information even about thin layers or small faults. Similarly, this can also give you a wide range of offset in order to go for deep penetrating refracted waves. So, it is it's, it's more accurate if you are going with the dense wide aperture acquisition. Identifying seismic anisotropic also is possible whenever we are, we are going with dense array primarily related to the anisotropic available in a particular region is basically representation of physical property variation along the subsurface medium which is primarily related to change in the mineral alignment. It can be because of fracture orientation or it can be because of fluid which is filled along this particular cracks which some time back we have also tried to target from uh, uh, seismic tomography. So, in the context of active faults identification of seismic and isotropic reveals the orientation and intensity of folding and faulting which are available in a particular subsurface medium. So, active fault mapping it is quite important as far as seismic hazard is concerned because this is going to give you potential region in which uh, potentially earthquake can, can happen in the near future. Now, here 
So, based on N C 2 investigation what one can get is potential surface trace of the fault which is going to give you even the surface rupture length. So, Wells and Copper Smith in uh, 1994 proposed different correlation related to different fault mechanism, where based on the surface rupture length which is available one can identify what is the potential magnitude of the earthquake to be triggered. So, if you look at this particular equation S R L is surface rupture length, if we know the value of S R L based on A and B which are function of what kind of fault mechanism one is dealing with. If we do not know the fault mechanism again independent of that we can have the value of A and B as shown over here. So, taking those values taking surface rupture length which has been identified based on tomographic observations can be brought over here and then one can find out what is the potential magnitude of earthquake likely to occur or what is the true potential in terms of magnitude of the earthquake which can be uh, which can get repeated during the uh, on a particular fault. Again, uh, so this continuing surface faulting and associated features as far as seismic tomography is concerned. So, we can have many more uh, informations. So, a mapping of sur surface features, mapping of vertical offset, again it is going to give you an indication about crystal movements, lateral offsets also there, then measuring the strike and dip values and then sand balls and uh, liquefaction feature. So, uh, these are like geological techniques which will also give you an indication about potential activity in a particular region. Sources of error can be there. If the GPS which are going to be used it is of low precision, if there are too much of undulation we cannot use it to uh, accurately measuring the distances and due to as you are going very close to the surface there will be loss of confinement as a result of which whatever actual vertical and lateral offset had happened along the fault plane that might be relatively bigger as far as near surface area is concerned. So, generally in terms of vertical and lateral offset which is actually happened in the subsurface medium, if you go very close to the surface medium or near the surface because of low confining pressure that particular offset will be significantly higher. So, this can also lead to sources of error in field acquisition as can be shown over here. So, there is some offset which is giving like vertical offset is there in vertical direction and as well as you can see over here also some lateral offset on two parts of the fault block. So, you can compare before and after an earthquake the two blocks which were in contact with each other has actually moved, but at the same time these are surface manifestations. So, the offset amplitude at the surface because of loss of confinement because at the surface you do not have any overburden pressure. So, that will be significantly wider it will be significantly deeper in comparison to the actual offset which is available beneath the ground surface. Again we can see that during a particular earthquake there were a lot of manifestation or uh, undulations which, which were there as part of surface manifestation, but it might happen that because of construction activity because of uh, may be too much of weathering also some portion of this surface manifestation has gone. So, there, there can be possibility of existence of gap in a particular region in terms of surface manifestations. So, you are having vertical offset, lateral offset at the same time you are also having gaps. So, one can take into account what are the uh, surface manifestation which are running all along the length of this fault. So, you can see over here primarily three segments are there which are showing some surface manifestation, some surface offset in terms of segment 1, segment 2 and segment 3. And absence of visible fault scar in this region due to earthquake demarcates a gap in surface rupture which might be because of some recognizable or unrecognizable destruction because it is not well identified even at times. So, one can go with mapping of uh, the features which have been collected based on tomography, based on geological evidences and also take into account the aerial photographs removing the uh, uh, I mean uh, having the photographs on uniform scale and then correlate the details with respect to seismological, geophysical, hydrogeological information. Now, active fault mapping help in estimating parameter for potential earthquake which has been mentioned in understanding the mechanical properties of the rocks in subsurface medium and even in terms of recent crystal movement because every time when we go for 
active fault mapping we will be take into account the neotectonics of a particular region. This collectively will be also helpful in identifying the potential hazard in a particular region. So, categories in which the active fault movement can be utilized in terms of map representation is rate of fault movement. So, in a particular region you are having different rate of movement along different faults. So, that can be uh, uh, mapped in the same fashion. Similarly, in terms of age some faults shown uh, may be movement in Holocene, some in Quaternary, some in Pleistocene. So, accordingly that can be resembled. Based on the type of mechanism, fault plane mechanism again on the map we can represent different kinds of uh, fault plane mechanism. If there are some volcanic or hydrothermal activities that can also be represented in the maps, which are also representing the location of active faults. And of course, if we are having fault plane solution, there might be information about when the earthquake had happened and what was the magnitude of the earthquakes. So, that can also be clubbed over here in order to find out the location for, uh, in order to develop the map for active faults. So, some of the active faults across the globe in Turkey also we are having some active faults identified. Similarly, in Guatemala there are some earthquakes uh, faults which have been identified as active in Africa also in South America also there are uh, faults which have been identified based on in situ measurements. Uh, now, this is one uh, numerical quickly we can go through this particular numerical. So, there are fault which is primarily indicating of compressive stresses that means, reverse faulting is there and three types of segments are there which are four basically segments are there which are going to give you respectively the length of segment which is undergone rupture. So, these are the rupture dimensions along a fault plane four places it has undergone rupture and these are the values of those rupture and the fault plane mechanism indicates it is reverse faulting. So, referring to the previous slide where we were discussing about Wells and Copper Smith correlation, one can take into account the correlation related to reverse faulting. The total rupture length will be equals to SRL will be equals to sum up all the rupture lengths which are given in the numerical you will get a total rupture length of 8.38 kilometer corresponding to reverse faulting whatever is the value of a and b take into account put the value in this particular equation one can get to know that this particular fault which has shown four different different segments of rupture is has actually produced an earthquake of 6.1 magnitude that means during a particular earthquake not the entire fault need to be undergo rupture there can be a small small section which can undergo rupture in active faults as i mentioned if it is not going to show any kind of movement along this particular fault, it is not showing any kind of building up of stresses regime on this particular faults, primarily these can be identified as inactive faults. But as at the same time, there can be a phenomena related to regaining of build up strain energy scenarios that means, which can lead to reactivation of faults which were identified which, which were uh, uh, inactive in earlier or in uh, geological time scale. So, reactivation is also primarily possible for active faults. So, there are some fault which is uh, which is in a inactive state at present which is given as here, here also Gine Quingi fault. Active and inactive faults can be distinguished based on the indication of displacement or surface manifestation primarily in neotectonic period of the terrain. So, an active fault may be activated uh, an, an inactive fault can be reactivated because of so many factors involving rupture in nearby faults, pressure depletion in hydrocarbon reservoirs that can also trigger some kind of seismic activity and rifted continental margin that can also lead to continental uh, including continental closure collision. So, that can also lead to fault reversal or at times uh, reactivation of the fault. So, this is uh, overall about what are the faults, what are the active faults, how one can um, identify active faults in neotectonic region, what geological features, what in situ measurements can be taken into account to identify potential surface manifestation. Thirdly, we also discuss if we have some information about what is the surface rupture length, how that can be taken into account to find out the magnitude of the earthquake. Even if we are discussing about some historic earthquake, if we are able to find out surface manifestation or offset values we can find out what might have been the uh, magnitude of that particular earthquake. So, thank you everyone and uh, this was all about active fault and what are the fault which should not be called as active as far as the neotectonic of a particular region is concerned. Thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.